This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. Welcome to the Craft Beer and Brewing Podcast. I'm your host, co-founder and editorial director of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, Jamie Bogner. My guest is joining us from El Cajon, California and Burning Beard Brewery, uh, Jeff Vitaker. Welcome to the podcast, Jeff. Hey, thanks for having me. Last time I was out there and, and uh, at Burning Beard was 2018 when we were in town in San Diego for our Brewery Accelerator event that you were part of. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. Um, you know, for readers of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, you may have recently uh, last fall read a, a story, our breakout brewer story on Burning Beard and uh, along with a recipe for In Praise of Bacchus uh, all in the magazine. Check that out. If you haven't, we're going to talk to Jeff in this episode about brewing spontaneous sales in warm climates, um, brewing standout West Coast style IPAs in a market that is really dense and heavy with such styles of beer. And then we're going to talk about uh, brewing and dialing in traditional styles uh, like uh, Czech Pale Lager, which is uh, such a fun one for this group of delinquents and punks, uh, self-described delinquents in Southern California. Before we uh, start the conversation as the brewing industry's premier choice for glycol chilling, GD Chillers has set the standard on quality, service, reliability, and dedication to their customers' craft. New this year, redundancy meets efficiency. GD's micro channel condensers are built with all aluminum construction, which eliminates galvanic corrosion. Using half the refrigerant of conventional condensers with fewer brazed connections translates to a lower GWP and less opportunity for leaks. Call GD Chillers today to discuss your project or reach out directly at gdchillers.com. Also, this episode is brought to you by BSG Hop Solutions. Meet the latest in BSG Hop Solutions portfolio, Sativa. Strong expressions of stone fruit, floral, and resinous pine flavors and aromas define this blend, crafted specifically for use in hazy IPAs and other hop-forward beers. Sativa is ideal for aroma, whirlpool, and dry hop additions to hazy and juicy IPAs, or for any other hoppy styles where a combination of citrus, tropical fruit, and pine aromatics are desired. Go to bsgcraftbrewing.com to learn more or call 1-800-374-2739. So Jeff, last time I was out there, it was 2018. It was earlier days for you. It seems like that was a decade ago and it was just three years. We've been through so much in the, in the meantime. Um, give uh, everybody out there the kind of quick arc of, uh, of Burning Beard history and your personal brewing history, how you got to where you are now uh, launching the brewery and uh, heading up the brewing operations. Wow. I don't, I'm not sure that there's a short version of that story, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, it starts with uh, like, like all great stories. Uh, there were, there was plenty of beer and I was uh, the, the inspiration for just getting into brewing at all was uh, basically all of all of san diego just being surrounded by ale smith society modern times uh, the list is long and really just wanting to uh not have to go to the pub to to drink this great beer I'm like hey let's look into to making some so my partner and i and we uh took to to home brewing and uh as it turned out, um, luckily got a contact in Quaff, joined Quaff, uh, ended up taking Home Brewer of the Year in 2014, and I baby stepped my way into uh, this this property here. Uh, just happened to ask if it would ever become available, and unbeknownst to me. The next day it was cleared out and they're like, Hey, here's your brewery space. And had no business plan, had no intention of ever opening a brewery, but it made me look into it. And I was like, ah, is this even possible? And turns out it was. And here we are. Um, I have a great partner, Mike Moss, um, another owner, uh, Shannon Lynette. She is uh, our taste room manager. You probably met her several times um yeah we we're just 
the three of us banging it out here and it's grown into a really cool little family and I love it. So you come up with this idea, you, know, you obviously come out of this Quaff homebrewing lineage and Quaff has produced a whole lot of fantastic professional brewers. Um, it's so cool to watch that kind of, um, you know, club thing help, uh, you know, just kind of, uh, you know, germinate and foster more of that brewing culture. Um, you know, you found a building you liked, uh, how, uh, what was the next step in figuring out what the hell you're going to brew? Oh man, what, what to brew? Uh, really it was, because you're in a dense market of San Diego. There's a whole <laughs> yeah. lot of beer there. People can get most beers that they want already. You know, figuring out how to m- build a brewery that people are going to want to go to and, and choose to to go to over other breweries. I mean, that that's a lot of pressure. Yeah, it is. It is. And we took it all off of our shoulders by not worrying about any of that. <laughs> <laughs> we literally did not consider the population when we were considering what we were going to brew. It was just the, the concept was to make a third space largely for ourselves. And what do we want when we're there? That's, that's what we decided to make. And, you know, so we're not, we weren't actively trying to position ourselves within a section of the market and, when when one considers like all of the trends that are out there right now, right? So a brewery that starts out now, do they say, "Oh man, I got to get into the seltzer game" or "I got to get into the uh, slushy IPA game"? You know, I, and I'm not against any of those. I, I come from home brewing. My philosophy is brewing should be fun. If if you're having fun making it, then you're doing a good job. So make make what you want to make, and then just just be your authentic self and they will come to you. That's that. I don't know. That's, that's really what we did. It was funny. Cause I've watched a conversation similar to that happen. Um, you know, on a, a pro brewing friends, Facebook page this past week. And there's always that push and pull dynamic, that question of, you know, it, it's a business. So you're making things for other people versus what people want is my creative vision and, you know, my approach to execution on that. You know, and I think it's an interesting one. You know, if you go too far in any direction, you know, you kind of lose sight of that. You know, you do have to make beer that people want to buy, of course, but people want to buy it not because you are cynically trying to plan the demographic approach and the, you know, the perfect mix to appeal to the, some idea of an ideal consumer. But, um, you know, if you approach it from these are the things I'm passionate about, I'm going to do the best job of making these things because I'm passionate about it then you tend to make better things, right? I mean, absolutely, you know, they, right? You, you, and if you make those better things, then they start to attract people because they're really good. Yeah, you know, I and I I I see it out there and I really feel sorry for those guys that stood up and and said, "I'm never making a hazy IPA." 2 months later, they're only making <laughs> hazy IPAs. Or I'm never making a seltzer. Half their boards are seltzers. You know, when you just say brewing should be fun, you get to make what you want to make. You don't have to sell your soul to be in business. Just have fun. Be yourself. You know, and I think a lot of those people that have come around to that, you know, and have had to back off of those extreme stances have, have ultimately seen the kind of challenge in brewing some of those things, you know, and right. as, a bre- as a brewer, like, you know, generally people love a good challenge. Like, can you make a hazy IPA that has this flavor potential that still expresses some idea of you? Well, how do you do that? And then you start going down that rabbit hole and you realize that like, okay, maybe I don't hate this as much as I thought I hated it. You know, as, as I get into that kind of problem solving and seltzer, I think is the same kind of thing. It's like, okay, this is a different kind of problem. Mm -hmm. How do I, you know, how do I approach this from a brewing perspective and make something that's interesting to drink, you know, that I, you know, feel, you know, reflects us, but also captures, you know, this flavor and the cleanliness and all these other things that I'm not used to doing as much as some of the other pieces, you know, they're, they're just new challenges to tackle. And I think Mm -hmm. it's interesting to see how many people as they get into some of those, enjoy it more than they think they might enjoy it. Right. And it's, it's all about that process. And if you, if one just says, Oh, you know, all a seltzer is is sugar and, and yeast and all a hazy is, is flour. yeast. (laughs) It's it's not that clearly. Uh, Or all, all you do with a Lambic is you just set it outside. You know, 
everything's more complex than than one might think from the outside. And what I had to hear from from friends when we were when we started brewing hazy IPAs, oh man, you know, that's it's weak game, whatever. Uh, you know, really, it's more complex than than they thought. And the, those people are now in the game as well. And just like you were saying, you you find that there's nuance, there is expertise, there there's that has to be applied in order to pull these things off. You you can't just leave it to the beer gods. It's it's not how it works. And, and it's funny. I mean, you know, we I make fun of the kind of you know that those closed minded approaches. But like, let's be honest, this kind of thing has existed in beer all over the world since the beginning of time. Um, there's an article in our next issue that Jeff uh, Allworth has written about the history of Kolsch, and he makes this point that like right. you know. If you go from Cologne to Dusseldorf, 25 miles down the river, like there's no Kolsch in Dusseldorf. They don't serve that beer. That is the, you know, the Köln beer that is, you know, and like 25 miles away, never the twain shall meet. You know, there are certainly these kinds of like, I'll never brew that, um, you know, it has some funny, you know, kind of historical relevance. Right. And so, you know, it's okay. We can laugh about it now looking back at at that kind of approach. Um, you know, but having said that, like, let's talk a little bit about your approach because you have definitely chosen to do some things the difficult way. Um, and it definitely, uh, you know, especially when it comes to kind of spontaneous brewing in an incredibly warm environment in a place where most people would say, how the hell do you do, you know, spontaneous brewing in San Diego? Uh, you found a way and you found an interesting way to make compelling beers. So uh, let's kind of dive in and talk about that. But before we do, the most common complaint about hard seltzers, they need more flavor. Extract alone is a weak flavoring agent and can leave a chemical aftertaste, but there is a better way. The craft concentrate blends from Old Orchard are packed with real fruit first, no added sugars, and just enough natural flavor. Breweries are turning to Old Orchard concentrates for seltzer with more body color and aroma. Turn seltzer skeptics into supporters with seltzer that drinks like a beer. Get started at www.oldorchard.com slash brewer. Also, for years, Brewery DB has been the industry's only professionally curated source of brewery and beer information. In 2019, over 1 million brewery visits were made by craft fans searching for breweries on BreweryDB.com. In just a few weeks, Brewery DB will unveil an all new experience to help craft lovers get back on the brewery trail. To take full advantage of the enhanced marketing power of Brewery DB and increase your taproom traffic, set up your account on marketmybrewery.com. That's marketmybrewery.com. It's easy and it's free. So Jeff, walk me through this uh, crazy idea to, uh, you know, to brew spontaneously fermented Lambic style or Lambic inspired beers, uh, in Southern California. We've talked to uh, Harrison from Beachwood about this a little bit. And, you know, certainly on the podcast have, um, uh, you know, dove into that kind of warm weather before, but it's all interesting. You're even further South and in a very dry climate in a, a place where it just doesn't seem like that kind of thing should or exist or could <laughs> exist. So, um, so talk to me about, um, you know, that process. I imagine it wasn't just a, Hey, we did a batch and it worked out and it was great the first time around. <laughs> I imagine there was some, some learning and some process that went into producing beer that was uh, actually good. Yeah. You know, there, there was, there was a lot of, of learning and yeah, we, we've dumped a lot of beer. The, <laughs> the the thing about where we are now we we had this plan the we, we the ministry of beer that's me mike shannon we had this plan from the beginning to to somehow do lambic style beers in, at, at burning beard and we had uh, all sorts of different different concepts and what we ended up going with and it just worked out that the building next door became available we were able to build a wild cellar on the opposite side of our brew house so we have this really cool space and having visited cantillon and just this this whole concept of how how it goes into the rafters and they have this great the, the spectacles of me like if you're into beer it's beautiful it's 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 the mecca of beer right so 
a deep romanticism down to the the cobwebs right. and uh you know all the awfulness and the old gears you yeah. know moving things and everything else sure sure and i am a hopeless romantic and i i it's all about bringing a part of that to San Diego, but also how to make it work. And uh, so I found a, a copper cool ship. Uh, we had that shipped in from China. And while that was making its year long voyage over here, we built a cedar shed to sort of replicate the attic space of, of Cantillon and to hedge our bets, uh, just why cedar. Uh, well, the whole idea was that we, we didn't want to go with, with pine, some, some weird pressure treated wood. We wanted to go with something that would have, have some character, but, but not leak a bunch of weird tar <laughs> into our, into our beer. So it had to, uh, you know, the quality of the wood came into into question but you never want to use pressure treated wood or anything with kind of chemical additives right you know it, it's funny because i mean i and i've i've seen lots and lots of cool ships in my day and you know the crooked stave here in denver mm. has a they use a pine untreated pine so definitely not pressure treated um which you know chad has mentioned has a little bit of antimicrobial property in the mm -hmm. pine itself you know but they're counting on that drip back into the vessel or if you go um see like uh phil markowski's cool ship out, up at area two in connecticut i mm -hmm. mean it almost looks like a um ship hull <laughs> with this kind of you know kind of inverted uh you know curved right. into the center yeah. just to like facilitate that drip back in yeah you know again off of that untreated wood you know ceiling and so you know part of it is funny to see like optimizing for that um evaporation up and then falling back into the kind of right. you know, cool ship piece. Um, so I was just curious if there was, you know, how, how that kind of figured into your plans. That, that was it. It was to, to make sure that we weren't getting any weird chemicals and we weren't going to hinder the process by somehow using some antimicrobial uh, version of wood. Uh, but yeah, so the, we had the shed built and basically to create this house for the steam to create that sort of condensation effect. We have a positive pressure fan in the room pulling in the night air. And really it started from home brewing wild ales. Uh, my backyard is, it's very tropical, like lots of bamboo, birds of paradise, palm trees. And what, what I would do with home brews is that I basically use a five gallon turkey fryer, pull pantyhose over the top of it and let it sit out overnight. And sometimes the beer would come out great and sometimes it wouldn't. And eventually it started to come out really good. And we were able to get a consistent product out of it. And that, that yeast strain, that, or I guess that mixed culture became our first wild ale here. We were dabbling with that while we were trying to get the cool ship up and running. So now as you know, we're, we're at year five, at year four, we were able to start producing 100% spontaneously fermented beers. And that's, that's where we're at. That's where we're all about now. We have, we have other things that run through the cool ship, our Saison, for example, and that we do pitch our mixed culture in that in there. But uh, for our, basically are in praise of Bacchus. We have like this whole series in praise of pear and praise of apricot. All of that is, is that fruit in that Lambic style base. So we, we, uh, yeah, I, we love the cool ship. It's just, just starting to gain some momentum though. So you started making mixed culture ales through, obviously started homebrewing first mm -hmm. and you did spontaneous captures in your backyard, um, which you say some worked and some didn't. Mm -hmm. Was there, you know, as you were doing that, did you, were you able to kind of figure out what the conditions were that helped, you know, uh, achieve more success than others? Were, yeah. you know, how did that kind of learn and go? Were there, you know, were there nights that were better than others? Were there times a year? Was it humidity levels? You know, were there some factors that you as a kind of, you know, nerdy brewer were tracking that right. uh, showed more success? Dude, the equation was so easy to figure out. 
I was a shitty seller, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, at least man. you're honest about it. God, I, I, you know, so many batches of beer that I ruined by just checking them too often, just introducing oxygen. And next thing you know, I, I nail polish everywhere. It was, it was horrible. Yeah. So don't be a shitty seller, man. That's, that's my message to everyone. But yeah, the overall, the way that I would plan brew days where I do wild, I would do it in the winter. And we have, when, when we have clear skies out here in San Diego, it can, it can get pretty cold. It, we're not sub freezing temperatures, obviously, but if we're in the low forties, that I, good enough. And that's kind of, we have to take what we can get out here and that's often what we get. And, uh, it's, it worked at the house and I, I'm, I'm 90% sure that when those batches of beer didn't work out, it was all me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was me. Um, well, cr- critics might say that your tank geometry was all off. If you right. were just doing it in a kettle like that with uh, you know, a, a pretty deep, um, you know, pool of liquid in your surface area, you know, to, to, you know, liquid volume wouldn't have been as traditional, you know, for a cool ship. I don't know. I, I checked that my surface area to volume ratio was for that Turkey fryer was pretty good. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> it wasn't the, it wasn't that it was me. Oh man. But uh, you know, that's, that's how, that's how you learn. Right. Sure. I don't know. Sure. That's one of the ways you learn. And that's how I did. So you then kept that culture you know, that you had spawned, you know, from some of these spontaneous home brews mm-hmm. and kept, kept that culture going to make then, you know, and then repitched some of that culture into some of the earlier wild ales mm-hmm. from burning beard. Um, you know, how did, uh, how did that go? You know, um, how did you keep that culture alive and how did, uh, you know, did, you know, as you kept, you know, feeding it to, to have it keep, uh, you know, be able to function in that kind of pitched environment, did you find it changing in any way versus, you know, say what some of those, um, original, how it tasted after that original spontaneous, uh, fermentation? Uh, well to guard against it changing over time, uh, we banked it at Y labs. So uh, took it, propped it up here, used it and then came up with that. Oh man, we really like this. We'd prefer that it not go away or, or turn into something, sure, sure. turn into something that we weren't hoping for. We didn't want it to acidify, just go super tart too fast. So just keeping this sort of patient zero version of that, that culture going, that's, it's still alive and well at Y labs. And we, we, pull it out about once a year and, and, and tinker with it. But yeah, the, the first, first go round, we, we had loads of barrels that we happened to come across and worked with those and learned a lot about how to keep and maintain barrels like the early Sellerman days in my backyard, learned the hard way on just how how to not keep a barrel and then consequently how to keep a barrel. We we've really learned uh, the hard way here. And, but the great thing about that is those lessons are the ones that I won't forget, (laughs) but yeah, the uh, yeah. So we kept that culture going and, and it's still alive and well in our Saison song of Orpheus. And I love it. It's a, it's a blend of spontaneous and that, that mixed culture. So it's a really unique beer and we're, we're trying to do a, a sort of San Diego or with that thing. So you can come in here and you can have it young, you can have it, take the bottles home and age them. And it's such a trip to see how, I mean, it's the same thing. I don't get over or all fresh out here. Who does? Right. Right. But right. if you happen to be there, the experience is different than when you come here and you have a bottle of it. And I'm just applying the, that to this template of, of our house Saison. And it's, it's really similar how it, it just, it comes out with this really cool hoppy character at first. And then as it ages, it, it just becomes this really cool Brett and fruity, bomb and i it's it's a lot of fun beer to make and to drink 
Sure. Um, as you then moved from home brewing, you know, into the the brewery itself with your your cool ship, um, did you take any steps to try to you know bring some culture along with it? Um, you know, to make sure that the cool ship batches out of the brewery, you know, had some common thread with uh, you know your home brewed uh, cool ship batches. Yeah, absolutely. And that's it's back to to Cantillon when they had to. Uh, like basically re refurbish their their spot. I was like reading up on what they had to do and spray the walls with your culture, and that's what we did. We we literally painted our walls with, with <laughs> our culture, and so that sounds gross, but uh, <laughs> it, it's very effective. Yeah, right. Um, this is not for mixed audiences. Yeah, so we sprayed the walls. We painted the walls with uh, with our Brulanta Meteo, which is our Esperanto named culture, and the yeah, it's, which is the the homebrew version. And it's just the walls are painted. We knock out into the cool ship, turn the the fan on, close the door, and we come back the next day, put it into the fooder, put it into barrels. That is it. See, it, it kills the 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 pure romance, though, of, of spontaneous fermentation to know that you actually just inoculated the entire <laughs> room. <laughs> well, we didn't pitch we didn't pitch yeast in this. We just you know put the yeast in the room so that it would naturally. No. Dude, uh, <laughs> <laughs> trust me, man. We're in a an industrial building from 1967 that oh housed I don't know. I don't know how many meth labs. <laughs> you trust me. We had to paint the walls with something. But yeah, romance wise, we're just we're hedging our bets. And we're not dipping sticks in there. It's a fan, night air, full blast. And the cool thing, and once again, if you visited Cantillon, it is in this, it's it's in a colorful neighborhood to to put it politely. It's this sure former farmland that is now this weird, maybe forgotten industrial area and time machine wormhole to El Cajon, California. That's literally where we are. We're in former farmland in this forgotten Eastern part of San Diego where spray paint and, and vagrants maybe outnumbered brewers at, at one time and, now we have flipped it around and and we're we're bringing a little piece of of belgium to san diego and if if it helps with the romance last year we did a collab with uh, doc brewing from ghent and uh so what does one do in a steamy cool ship uh but uh, you know we we might have had our shirts on or off i'm not gonna say but, uh, you know, to have some shirtless Belgian guys in there, that has to increase the romance of the room. They just brought some some culture with them, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that that's I, I just laugh about. It. I mean, this is the history of brewing. People, you figure out how what work makes better beer and how to do it. And it's something that brewers have been doing for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, you know, mm -hmm. you know, even before they knew what yeast was like, they knew that if they did this, it might produce better, you know, better tasting beer. And so they just did that, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and it's the same kind of thing with like, we romanticized, you know, the culture floating in the, the nighttime air, but, uh, you know, it is of course, all the things that the, you know, ultimately contribute to that and, uh, and making beer that tastes good is, is, um, hyper important. So talk to me then, um, uh, in that commercial sense about, uh, you know, some of you, you, you mentioned that you're, you're a terrible, you were a terrible seller person, <laughs> Yeah, um, but that you learned the hard way, uh, you know, talk to me about some of that learning and, uh, you know, what you found was necessary in order to, uh, uh, you know, what level of oxygen, um, control was necessary, uh, you know, in order to produce beer that you found was, uh, tasty and palatable. Uh, well, Zero. Zero is the oxygen level you want, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So how did I how did I improve that? Lots of reading. Um, everything's on YouTube. And then um, the best lesson I can give anybody out there is be 
open to surrounding yourself with good people. And um, I, the guy that's working with me now, Tyler, he, he came from Hangar 24. He was a sellerman there for, for many years. And every day I'm learning something new here. And I, I joke about it all the time, but it's not really a joke. I'm just a home brewer. I, this is my this is the first brewery I've opened, <laughs> hopefully my last. Um, but yeah, having surrounding myself with good people has, has really helped my learning curve. There's a lot of humility. Uh, humility is a part of it. And uh, once again, it's just having, being a part of San Diego, there's, it's such a brotherhood of brewers. And I, you know, I get to count uh, Kelsey McNair at North Park, uh, Bill Batten at Tap Room, Paul Segura, Carl Strauss. I, the, the, I had to count those people as friends and peers. And we talk, we learn from each other. And uh, that's, that's really helped me become uh, a much better brewer. That's, uh, that's awesome. So, you know, as you started laying back these cool ship brews out of, out of your cool ship, um, and then start, you know, tasting them, what's that kind of time frame look like before you start tasting them? You know, obviously you want to make sure things are, are moving along, but you know, you mentioned earlier that, um, you know, getting in and opening them up and tasting stuff just creates more potential for oxygen and grass, which is a bad thing. You know, what's that time frame look like for you? Uh, well, as long as they're, if it's in the fermenter or excuse me, in the fooder or in the barrel, as long as there's some pressure on there, the, the vinny nails, a, a nice way to go with the, with the barrel, uh, the fooder where we have the fooder crafters, th those guys make amazing things. And, sure. uh, you know, we have a sample port on that and basically just we'll cap that and, uh, allow a little bit of pressure to build up and it's, It'll keep the oxygen ingress down and we're able to sample it. I generally don't even get into a fresh batch until, oh, what is it? We're, so we're in, we're April coming up. We just pulled samples of our last cool shit brew, which was end of December. And uh, so, yeah, th maybe three months and we're, Looking at, let's see, last year, so we're at 18 months. We have a framboise, first time doing that. We had, we got some locally sourced raspberries, couldn't pass it up, and so pulled some of our lambic pale off of the fooder, threw it in the barrel with the, the raspberries, and we're actually getting ready to bottle that next week. So it's because we're such a small brewery, it's just the two of us in the brew house, me and Tyler, and Timeline is our our ability to do the work works really well with with wild ale so that it takes a lot of time and uh we don't have a lot of it here so when we finally get to it is really you can just thing. ignore it for a long time yeah. and it's still gonna be okay so you know when yeah, you get to it you get to it because really no one's buying sours anymore so we're we're just it's it's really taken a hit recently and and our our production is meeting with customer demands maybe slightly more slightly more so we're it's yeah it's really a, it's a, a romantic love affair it's a, it's an art project and the great thing about it is it allows us to hone our skills it allows us to refine our process build a wide platform and and hopefully we'll move up from there and what else can you do Fair enough. You got to do some of the things that you love in the, in the, you know, kind of context of, of a brewing business to keep yourself interested and in, right. Keep, uh, keep pushing your own skills and also, you know, just to explore the potential of flavor there. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, when you think about blends, how, what kind of variety, I mean, you know, in terms of, you know, barrel and fooder, do you end up with barrel to barrel, you know, um, you know, how, wide generally are, are some of the samples that you're pulling from when you create a bigger blend? Oh, okay. Um, or are you not brewing enough to really have that much difference in yeah. the overall stock? Well, yeah, we don't have a, a ton of things that we, we are pulling from right now. We have, um, well, we have, 
we have like these two large 30 barrel feeders and we're, we have one that's Flanders base and the other one's Lambic style. And when we will fill those feeders and if we have anything extra, we'll fill a barrel or two and we'll, we'll do a little side project with those. And then as, as the beers start to mature a little and as fruit becomes available, we'll start pulling those things off. And then, so we might do a, a fruit blend with, with uh, maybe just the, the pale, the Lambic style. We might add in a little more of the Flanders, but really what right now, what we're doing is trying to develop our, that, those styles. We're not trying to do any blending. We have, we have some, a lot of weird things going on. Uh, we made this, uber belgian quad that with uh in collaboration with society brewing and it was this huge beer and we made way too much of it so we threw some in barrels and we we uh we we basically pulled a jug off of our lambic style fooder and dumped it in there and it's we have oh man six oak barrels that are just they're two years old we debuted the quad at Calaba Palooza. Uh, I, th- I think it had to be two years ago. Right. And now that beer, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's so hot. It's crazy. We have to blend that down. And <laughs> we, we have, uh, we pulled our ESB and we knocked some of that out into the, the tank that had, we have a stainless tank. We'll, we'll, knock our um saison out into and we just ran our esb banksy through that and so that's been sitting on that that yeast strain and that's doing its thing we have the flanders going we have that uh sacred geometry the beer we did with society and what we'll do what we're, we're at we're at right now is we're pulling i don't know we have probably four or five things that we can do to try to come up with something unique and everything is super small batch. We're, we're like, we'll have a hundred and I don't know, 150 to 200, 750 milliliter, milliliter bottles. That's, you know, we're doing once again for the, the romance of, of things, nobody's buying seven fifties. That's fine. We're doing it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but so if, if you're in a small batch, uh, spontaneously fermented beers this is the spot for you but we have yeah we're, it, it'll be a small run no, nobody wanted 16 ounce cans and still tr- <laughs> until treehouse started putting hazy ipa in them right and now right. everything's in 16 ounce cans like it's only a matter of time it'll all come back around yeah. eventually um it's just gonna drive people crazy in the meantime but right. yeah no that's uh you know yeah s- stick with it it's it's funny too i mean and i hear it all the time from folks like yeah nobody buys 750s anymore but then i've also heard like nobody also buys 375s of these <laughs> beers and so it's not like switching to these beers to 375s is just gonna magically sell more of them yeah and in fact like when you look at it, the you know one uh, prominent brewer that brews spontaneous a while they also selling me like they ultimately end up selling more in 750 more dollar value in 750s just because there are a certain number of people that really want those beers mm-hmm. they'll buy it in whatever format it is and the people that don't want those beers are not going to buy it magically just because it happens to be in a 375 right, right and so by putting it in a 750 you just you're selling a little more volume of it and uh you know and it just makes a little bit more commercial sense um but it sounds like you've got a super blend uh in the in the making with uh, some of these uh fun little projects that you've been playing with yeah there there is and you know like i said with the lambic we we kind of try to keep that as pure as we can and we'll we'll pull it off for some fruits and do some different things there but that's that's really the extent of what we're doing at this moment sure i want to ask you i'm going to give you the sensory question in a second and ask you how you describe the flavor because i love getting into that kind of brewer mind of sensory but before we do that the founders launched ss brew tech with a very clear goal to advance brewing equipment design, performance, and quality to the very highest standards in the industry. With a team that draws upon strong functional backgrounds in brewing science, mechanical engineering, industrial design, supply chain, and manufacturing, SS Brewtech has the people and skill sets you want and expect 
from your supplier of pro brewing equipment. Head over to ssbrewtech.com for more information on their brew houses and brewing gear. Also, when it comes to brewing, nobody has your back like Clarion because their food grade lubricants are formulated to help make your brewing system 100% food safe. That means when you switch to Clarion, you can put the costly potential of contamination and recall out of your mind. All you need to worry about is brewing great beer. And since you already do that, well, it's more like focusing on business as usual. Go to clarionlubricants.com to learn more. So Jeff, as you taste this spontaneous beer, obviously you've, you've got context having, you know, uh, experience with other American spontaneous beers and Belgian spontaneous beers, Lambic and Goose. You know, when you taste this terroir that you get a your brewery out of your spontaneous beer, um, how do you describe it? How do I describe what we're making? How do you describe the flavors? And, um, you know, do you have a, a kind of a, a sensory profile that you articulate for uh, for the way that it tastes? Yeah. Uh, well, um, fortunately, out here in the deep East County, um, I went to high school. There was a huge 4-H program. My sisters were in 4-H. So uh, I am familiar with intimately with Barnyard. And uh, <laughs> actually, I, I just had this discussion with a customer. He's like, man, I don't know what a horse blanket smells like. I'm like, all right, you're in the East County out here. You ride motorcycles. The inside of your leathers, man, that. Um, yeah. So what is our vernacular? Well, it is really there. There is this really cool barnyard um, leather strap. And if if you don't ride motorcycles, don't have a horse. Maybe you have a guitar that has a leather strap or you had a leather jacket. Like the, there, there's something to that, but it's, and this is the the thing. It's all about connecting memories to what you're, you're sensing and food does it does a lot. So um, like currants, for example, who out here in America knows what a current tastes like. If you haven't been to England, you wouldn't um, most likely, but all right, raisins or dried cherries or so anyway, what are we doing? We are, it's, we have a lot of barnyard. Um, it's really apricot skin. We have a little peach. It's, it's a really nice, subtle fruit aroma with, uh, with a complex barnyard character that's that would be our overall wild experience out here what what are the terroir that we were developing um it's not super biting so if you're if you're one of those guys that remembers the 2014 de guard where your your teeth felt like they were gonna crack we're not we're not there yet we're not we're not making those beers at this moment um but it's it's and th- thankfully trevor isn't either now right and uh <laughs> right has found the the ways to keep that under control yeah 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 so you know that there are a lot of people that love that and they, they come out here they go, this isn't what i wanted I, what it's not it's not sour enough and hey this this is just who we are this is what 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 we make and really it's it's all about this subtle interplay of this this barnyard experience with these really soft and delicate fruits and it's it's in this really cool harmony that's almost is escapes any sort of description unless you're you're sitting there experiencing it but there's there's something to this taking it off the fat rocky head and and just plugging those plugging memories into into that that sensory experience and saying oh man this this reminds me of when i was walking through this field and i you know and this one time i had a picnic and it was raining and the way the grass smelt and the blanket got wet and that that it's it's in the beer you have to you have to be able to plug into that memory but man it's it's totally there it's this really cool harmonious experience that i love as you can tell i'm not passionate about it at all <laughs> 
<laughs> no, that's fun. Um, what is your uh, what's your approach to hops? Obviously, we're if we're talking about acidity and acidity levels, that certainly plays into it. And you know, it's a subject close to my mind because it was just down in Austin uh, in February, and uh, Jeff Stuffings and I went out to the the barn and uh, you know grabbed some of bags of uh, aged hops out of their you know rooftop or out of the the uh, rafters of the barn. Um, and I mean, they were just gross and shattered and brown and disgusting oh, man. and absolutely perfect for their spontaneous beer you know of course out at uh in the the veil uh when i was there last year matt tarpey you know he's got his bins of, of various uh aged hops that they kind of cycle through and and um you know and keep them open air and but then also kind of you know uh, turn them over in order to kind of make sure that all the hops get exposed to air what is you know what do you do for uh, you know kind of hops uh, approach to these spontaneous and wild ales uh we're using a lot of hops uh in, in each beer um and they're aged right now that are the hops we're using are pretty close to 10 years old and they are very 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 ripe uh, i don't know if you haven't smelled that that is that is something to uh that's a sure, sensory sure. experience to plug yourself into right uh, you can understand how lambic style beers taste the way they do when you start smelling some of those hops also right and that's that's really one of those those keys you can't brew this this style of beer with 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 new hops it's it has to have that that hoppy that funky hop character and uh i i just happened to meet the right guy this and this is the story of bernie beard it's it's all about serendipity and i talking to this guy we had a lot in common we're talking about music and life and uh eventually got to brewing and he was talking about how this his owner is making him brew with six-year-old hops <laughs> i'm like oh man that's that's really tragic i mean making west coast ipa yet those those are not ideal hops as a person <laughs> We all know, and I'm like, dude, I, I wish I could get some hands on uh, my hands on those for some of these, uh, some of our beers. At, you know, because trying to buy find aged hops if if you haven't already cultivated this the source, right? That's it's a process. Um, so anyhow, their brewery goes under. He's like, hey man, I grabbed all these hops for you. I knew you wanted them. He just comes over, and trades me beer for a an obscene amount of used hops so that's that's really our supply and then once we we started from using those we're able to cultivate our own we're at five years and we have a whole slew of hops that are aging out for future brews but we have oh man so much from uh this ancient source of mine and we're really lucked out with it and uh it's, it gave us a head start are you, um, you know, using kind of noble-ish or low alpha hops for these and then aging them? I'm curious because you mentioned he was trying to make West Coast IPAs with uh, older hops and that just screams higher alpha to me. Yeah, it, um, it does. But when you put it in a age calculator, it's, yeah, the, they're maybe two IBU, <laughs> if you, even the Columbus, which, you know, right, right. over 10 years. Um, and just for fun, I, I've t even taken some, we, we have access to these really huge pizza ovens and we've laid some out in trays and aged them at about 150 degrees for 12 hours. Oh man, what that does to a room, holy cow. But also what it does to the hops, you know, we're, it's like super oxidizing them. And, uh, th those are, we've actually tinkered with and they've, they have, remarkably similar qualities to the long aged hops, but, um, yeah, what are we using? Uh, we're basically anything we could get our hands on, but we have trended towards the nobler varieties. It's, it's sort of like our brew schedule, uh, out here in the, the hot, hot El Cajon. What are we doing when it comes to when we schedule our brews and how, how, what do we do when it's hot out? Um, fortunately, we're able to select periods of time where it's 
just less hot than than other times and we're able to do that now with with our hop selection we have so much time to plan that we're we're able to use uh start out with a lower alpha hop and we're, we're we have quite the store at the moment that's great do you um temperature control the cool ship at all to try to you know make sure that your cooling time you know keeps it in the right temperature zone long enough to you know achieve um, you know the the kind of pace of cooling that you're looking for or uh do you just let it run wild oh uh, we just let it go and uh cool. yeah we i was trying to like i trying to 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 work that out and i was trying to work it out in this very organic way with basically the, the time of day that a brew might finish and so manipulating brew day schedules in order to to do that very thing all right it's going to be colder right. here, longer uh it turns out it at least here in el cajon it didn't matter at all and uh, it's finished brews at midnight finished at 10 a.m. finished at 4 p.m. and but one of the things that that's really worked out well for us uh, December nights are freezing out here that we're in the high 30s low 40s and it's it's really weird I I have this obsession with the almanac and when a storm comes through right after a storm followed by a cold front and we've we've been able to time most of our brews after that so that's that's been one of those things uh it, we haven't really had to suffer the effects of high heat although we do um our saison we'll just brew whenever we want to and and that that's in that same cool ship and we've done june july batches and we haven't really suffered any of those superstitious effects of of high heat we lucked out it's kind of fun yeah Yeah. it's kind of fun well we've been talking a whole lot about um you know brewing spontaneous beer and i would love to talk a little bit about um you know another tradition that you love which is european style uh, lagers um you know your norm core czech style pilsner you know was a, a staple of your home brewing early on and something that you've also brought into the brewery talk to me a little bit about that process over many many years of brewing oh, oh, man. to kind of capture you know this idea of uh, of jack pilsner because you know i mean that you know for a lot of brewers like mastering you know pilsner or pale lager in general um you know is a lifelong quest mm-hmm. um you know talk to me about about your quest on that uh, that journey to to check pale lager oh man it, it is it's what's crazy about it is there's probably not a beer that i've brewed more and Sure. The, the, over the last year, uh, every time I do it, I'm like, all right, this is it. This is the last last change we have to make. And they're all like the, the most seemingly insignificant changes. Um, but man, that, that beer, it's really gone through a lot. And if it makes it out the other side, holy cow. Um, but th- yeah, the way it started out, um, it's probably, it was probably people would call it closer to a Dortmunder. There was no real water control at all. And it started out here at the brewery with this, a a ton of late edition hops. And really what's happened is through loads of experimentation, I've hop backed it, hop stand, uh, didn't dry hop it, but tweaked Whirlpool, Everything has shifted and and pulled back to a, a much much earlier editions. We've used 100% check saws the entire time, but really what we found is that any late edition check saws has this grassy this vegetal character that will lead one to believe that it's DMS, and that has that has been the 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 bane of this beer is like how do i get this really amazing check saws expression without that and that pulling it back getting it as far away from the end of the boil as possible has been the trick yeah and one of those fully naked moments as a home brewer right what is the what is the first beer that a home brewer makes right it's the imperial triple chocolate chai tea with uh 
some nutmeg and uh, 14 raisins in it. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I think that was literally the pyramid. <laughs> well, with, with Normcore, it's was, man, I, this Czech sauce is going to pop. We're going to put it everywhere. And, and I did, and it was not the best. Um, really, it was going back to basics and transforming it. it it's just become this really long brew day. And we're doing a step infusion mash on it um, and starting out with some first wort hops and then really our last additions right about 75 minutes um man it's really the this recipe has taken a, a a huge tweak um it's a long and difficult process to make such a simple beer that uh you know a lot of potential craft beer consumers look at it's like oh okay um <laughs> right or that's a nice beer uh you know and then you know move on to, to something more bolder more flavorful um you know so i'm assuming you've got a, a 90 minute boil um and correct me if i'm wrong but like how then you you so you start with first wort hops and then your last edition is at 75 minutes um how does that generally split up in percentages of hops uh you know in each spot up there uh we're at two two hours and oh, two uh, hours okay yeah and it's it's actually just for color and caramelization or uh um, yeah i mean obviously yeah uh exactly we're we're trying to get some some character out of there out of the grain um but yeah split is it's about a third at first wort and uh two thirds at right about 70 70 minutes and it's uh like I said, all, all check saws, there's really not much to it except for everything I told you about earlier. <laughs> <laughs> it's a funny thing. Like there's not much to it, but you've got a very limited palate from which to build exactly the flavors that you want. Um, from a malt perspective, uh, where, where do you land on that? Oh, man. Well, I was using uh, Chateau Pilsner ex- exclusively. I really like that. And... Uh, then BSG stopped carrying it. Uh, we're, we're using demons at the moment and I'm liking that a lot. And it's, it's cool. We get to use demons there and we have a German style, uh, Pilsner as well. And, uh, we're using Vireman for that. Um, yeah, actually just the other day I was talking with a friend of mine. He's like, dude, you're in San Diego. Why do you need two, two Pilsners on the board? I'm like, we have five. <laughs> <laughs> we don't just have two. Um, Anyway, uh, yeah. Because you'd like to do things the hard way. Right, yeah. right. And man, it, it, best beer to brew in the middle of a pandemic. Am I right? You know, it's so funny because we're in the midst of our uh, our annual lager issue right now. And I've been doing like for the last three weeks, I've been doing blind tasting sessions. Um, one of the things that has struck me is that on aggregate in general over the past year, Brewers have gotten American brewers have gotten better at brewing lager. And I don't think that it's a coincidence that this was a year of COVID, you know, that brewers had a little more time and had a little more flexibility with some of those tanks. And I think that, you know, um, tasting a year over year, we, you know, we get to kind of watch this, you know, year over year change in varying styles. And I think that that was a, it was, visible to me you know you could taste it like Mm -hmm. it in general you know it's not that any one got so much better than it was the previous year but the general level of lager brewing has improved greatly even over just just this past year because more folks are paying closer attention to it and um you know and there are more resources for folks to learn from and uh you know it's it's a cool thing to watch i mean i love that more american craft brewers are making better lagers now um you know, in terms of uh, kind of fermentation and finishing with this, uh, you know, this Czech lager, obviously fermentation becomes a hugely important piece of the equation. Um, what is what does yours look like? Oh, well, I mean, first, uh, start out with make sure you have enough yeast, right? Oh, if you don't, it, it'll just never take off. Um, so we, it depends on everybody's system, but we actually, because of the way ours works, some people like to knock out above their fermentation temperature and while during that lag phase, it'll settle in and 
uh, we have to do the opposite. We we knock out just under our fermentation temperature. So we're, we'll set it, our, our fermenter at 50. Uh, we let that left that ride for as long as possible. And then we'll we raise the temperature on that, uh, do a little at, towards the end of, of fermentation, um, just a, a sort of a de-rest, make sure that the beer cleans itself up. We hold it there till it passes. Uh, forced diacetyl test and then we have a long slow crash and uh it's loggers in the tank and that is it it's it's not as as tricky as 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 many it's pretty simple you just hold it at 50 and uh, let it do its thing what kind of what yeast do you ferment with well it 800 so if it's actually the same at white labs and bsi mm-hmm. um and yeah, they're they're both they both do a great job. Yeah, so the check strain eight hundred. And then, you know, as I'm thinking about these changes, you you mentioned that your primary mode of improvement has been hopping and reeling in your American brewer, uh, in, you know, desire to to think big and and then you know editing that back down to to where it should be. Are there any uh, you know other pieces of that kind of editing process that you've uh, you found have made a you know a significant improvement in that you know the beer since you've been bringing it over the last few years? Uh, well, uh, the hop hopping was was the huge one. Um, really. W- what it was the the evolution of the beer sort of developed as we started brewing other lagers and how do we how do we maintain the integrity of this beer and differ, differentiate it from the other beers right so a a german pilsner should be drier and crisper and working with a palate that looks remarkably similar to the other palate so Really, in that process, um, all right. So, in our German Pilsner, how how is that beer progressing? What does it look like compared to Normcore? And seeing that um, p- played with the mash temperature a little bit, and we're a lot lower on our German. We're higher on our our Czech. We will step it through. Um, we'll we'll start out around 150 and we have we're able to steam our our mash ton and uh the way ours works is we have to paddle the heck out of that grain to to get any sort of uniformity in there and we'll we'll step it up uh to you know we're trying to take care of that the both the beta and the alpha amylase and make sure that we have both fermentability and the dextrins to give a nice mouth feel and really yeah, so the entire beer's gone through this evolution. It, before it was classic home brewer, 152, see you later. <laughs> and put it in the, the kettle, 90 minutes, done. But the fine-tuning of it is is getting it through that, that enzyme spectrum. All right, we did that. Now get it into the kettle. We want a little more character from the kettle. So we're going to extend that that brew time. All right, the, the malt is it's expressing itself the way we want it to now. And holy cow, I have way too much Czech saws character. We need to, we need to dial that back. This is not hot Mata or West coast IPA. We're not, we're not trying to, you know, we don't want this chlorophenolic um, bomb. We want, we want subtle noble hop character when this awesome bready malt character. And that, that is really the evolution the best thing that we could have done for Normcore was brew our Czech Pilsner is brew that German beer so that we, we could compare the two and have this, this working template to go from. I love it. It's a little bit like whack-a-mole, you know, you yes. knock down this one thing and then it has unintended consequences over here that you then have to adjust for and, and rebalance. And, uh, over time you, you eventually the, the, you know, they stop popping up bigger, you know, the, the, you know, as, as the other effects start being smaller and smaller, mm-hmm. you know, the uh, patterns become they, apparent, right. You, you can predict yeah. now. Right. Right. And so eventually over time you, you massage it exactly where you want it. And, uh, you know, the, as you 
make small tweaks. It doesn't uh, impact other things and it gets to that beer that you actually want it to be. Mm -hmm. Um, but no, that's a, that, that's pretty awesome. Now, um, I, you know, I teased at the top of this that we have to talk about West coast IPA because you're in San Diego. It's, you know, this kind of home and spiritual birthplace of West coast IPA. And it just seems like we'd be remiss to not talk about that in some way or another, you know, since we're doing it and we're getting on in time here, but before we, uh, you know, before we get out of here, I do want to, to jump into this topic. Talk to me about, um, you know, thinking about West coast IPA, especially in this kind of current context, because by the time you opened a brewery, West Coast San Diego IPA was, you know, 15 years old, maybe, you know, 20 years old. If you consider that like 1996-ish or so, you know, birth uh, kind of period for, you know, for, um, you know, West Coast IPA, it had gone through its bitter phase. It had, you know, then in the early 20 teens started falling a bit out of favor as, you know, hazy and fruity, juicy IPAs, you know, became the thing. And then, you know, around the time you were starting the brewery, we started seeing this other trend happen in West Coast IPA that was starting to respond to that hazy, juicy, fruity thing. Also, you know, and it's not just this response. I shouldn't only cast it that way. I, I also mean, like, what we also see are the beers themselves responding to ingredients and the availability of ingredients, mm -hmm. you know, produced by the hops breeders and the agricultural side, you know. Um, we all forget that like Citra wasn't available last decade. You know, mm -hmm. that is a tw 20 teens decade, you know, product started around, you know, coming out commercially in the early 20 teens or being generally commercially available in the early 20 teens, you know? And so the beers themselves started, you know, taking advantage of these ingredients and brewers started making beers to reflect these greater possibilities than they had you know, in other times past, West Coast IPA has definitely embraced that same kind of thing. It's not just a response to hazy, juicy IPA. It is also, hey, we have these ingredients. How can we use them and make, you know, Campelli products? So for you, as you're, you know, coming, moving out of that homebrew space and moving into that commercial brewing space, um, you know, did you, what was appealing to you about West Coast IPA and how did you go about making one that reflected who you are and what you want to drink? Oh, well, it for like for most people out here that, that I know, it all starts with Sierra Nevada's pale ale. That is like the the Ur beer, right? Like sure. Oh, sure. And we're like we're in the motherland of West Coast IPAs. Pat and Sean McElhenney live up the road from us. That's right. They're uh, good friends of ours and uh we're just, they're out founders of Alpine Brewing for those that aren't familiar with them. We, and now McElhaney. Yeah, we don't mention that name. <laughs> we don't mention okay. <laughs> they're, they're from a brewery in the town of Alpine, right, right. just up the road from you right. in El Cajon. There we go. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you know. and, and now embarking again on their own uh, namesake brewery with their, their last name, right. um, you know, and back in the game. Yep. Um, yeah. So we have this incredible touchstone here in El Cajon and we're we're in the middle of it we have Alesmith and Society down the road and the McElhenney's up the other road and um wh where to fit in it's 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 kind of like the beer we grew up with we're not and and I know that over the course of time it wasn't the beer we grew up with it's just that how it's the frog in the jacuzzi. As beers got hoppier, we didn't notice because we're just drinking these beers all the time. But how did we find, how did we settle on who we are? The, the Mac ladies, I mean, they came up with Nelson, you know, like the Nelson hops all of a sudden became available in Alpine. And then all that available. brewery in Alpine. <laughs> right. But that brewery in Alpine, you know, started, you know, putting them in West Coast IPA. And it was like, oh man, that that's amazing. And it changed the way, you know, other brewers tasted it. And like, oh, that changes the way that I even think about what's possible in my own beers and how can I, yeah, how can I use those? And then right. everything gets crazy expensive. And then the hazy IPAs, you know, you know, brewers started using it in a different way. Um, you know, but these, these change your frame, your, your frame of reference. Right. You don't maybe notice it, you know, month to month, but it does happen over time. Totally. And one of the great things about, about that, having fresh beer from the McElhenney's, um, and, and even the hazy, the haze craze, the awesome thing about it, the thing I love the most is I get to 
serve fresh, cloudy West Coast IPAs. I get hop haze is everywhere. And it is like, it's a thing of beauty off the tank. And I don't have to worry about someone someone be a, being offended that they can't see their their fingers through the glass i'm i'm not we're not worried about that at all out here we we have it's cal ale uh we try to get the malt out of the way and then have pine and and resin slap you in the face that's that's what we're doing <laughs> now you brew more than one IPA, and so certainly you've also just in the same way that you bring a German, uh, you know, Pilsner helped you figure out how to brew a better Czech Pilsner. You know, brewing different hopped IPAs and taking some different approaches to IPA because I mean, you know, people want to drink those beers mm -hmm. and they want to have a few different things to try. You know, how did brewing different IPAs kind of help you, you know, think about? these you know different approaches that you take to them right uh, you know part of it was a large part of it was and the older brewers will will know and the home brewers it's playing with crystal malts and it's it's it is the c word of brewing right <laughs> or of brewing west coast ipa it it can lead to some oxidation if there's any age on the beer and that becomes problematic and then you end up with these maybe caramelly notes that interfere with the expression of the hops and, but if they're done right if you have some sea, some crystal malts in there uh it, it can make this really cool orangey sort of play off of certain hop varieties that is i i don't know if it's nostalgic for me but man it really it hits my heart in a certain way and it tastes amazing to me. So we, we have, we have some beers, some IPAs that will actually have crystal malts in it. And it's 2021 and who's doing that these days, but they're, they're, it's everything is cyclical, right? Everything is cyclical. And variety is the spice of life, man. So overall we've, we've experienced, uh, experimented with some heritage malts, uh, like played with Maris Otter and classic two row, of course, um, where else are we? We we've done Pilsner blends of them. We've messed with uh, some really cool floor malted varieties for some smash beers, um, and that those give us a chance. Once again, it's kind of a homebrewer style tool, a smash beer. We we're, we have this single malt, and we get to find out what this one hop is all about, and do these things work together. And we've had some great success with that and we've had some interesting failures but the the whole thing it's it's all about these filling that spectrum of possibility in that west coast ipa window and we have a few that hit on on various points and hot mata for us is our we don't have flagships in the sense of beers that never come off the board but we have what we call our core beers they will be there often and hot mata is one of those beers and it's Simcoe Citra forward and it's, it, that's it. And we have another one dankness visible and that beer it's mosaic and you end up with on great days, depending on batches, depending on probably humidity or solar flares uh, that mosaic can present as this crazy, lovely blueberry and complex fruit or it can be this crazy dank bomb and often it's layered in there somewhere you just got to find these flavors but on those certain days man when the blueberry kicks oh it's so good um but yeah that's we're everywhere very cool i i could we could keep going on this forever but we've now had the requisite ipa conversation so that we can put ipa in the title of this <laughs> and this in this episode will sell so much better oh, just so. just because just because we can put ipa in the title um <laughs> oh man sorry that was a healthy dose of cynicism right there uh, long term what is uh, what success look like for you for burning beer for your partner and or for your, your two partners and uh you know how do you define success when when will you know that you all have achieved it uh yeah we are we we have achieved it we are achieving it. it's crazy like every day like holy cow man we have people on the patio and we have this crazy group of regulars that are 
loyal, like this is the warriors, man. Like <laughs> they, they are like loyal. It's, it's nuts. Um, who knew we could, we could build this out here. It, it was a crazy idea. We didn't, it was an accidental birth in the first place. And, but if we're going to do it, we want it to be this authentic expression of, of who we are. And that, that is success. Um, going forward, if, if we could, uh, yeah, if, if we could open up distribution again, that's just cream, uh, cream, it's icing. That's what they call it. It's icing. It's not, uh, cream's good too. We, we don't really have any distribution at the moment because of COVID. Uh, we were just wrapping yeah. up into this, uh, really unexpected, um, revenue stream. We, we were all of us delivering kegs in the back of our cars and we have a amazing sales guy now and he's out there hitting the pavement uh fortunately canning's taken off so he's out there delivering cans but it kegs would be nice too and if if we ever get there um what success is it's it's developing it's it's a home and and this vibe and we have it you guys have stayed true to your kind of delinquent uh southern california rocker roots and uh um and i love that kind of sticking with that authentic self kind of you know piece to it um making beers that you want to make because you're passionate about them because they are better because you love making those it's it's cool approach gnd chillers is the brewing industry's premier choice for glycol chilling get those citrus tropical fruit and pine aromatics with sativa from bsg try real fruit concentrates from old orchard uh, take full advantage of the enhanced marketing power of Brewery DB. Let SS Brewtech outfit your brew house and gain peace of mind with Clarion Lubricants. Jeff, if people want to learn more about Burning Beard, come see you in real life, or find your beer or uh, whatnot. Where do they find you uh, on, on the internet and uh, out there in the real world? Uh, burningbeardbrewing.com. That's it. Um, Instagram, we're all over that. Our website will take you to those pages. Uh, for those of you still using Facebook, we have that. And uh, yeah, come down and see us. Really, uh, that's that's what we want. We want people to come see us. We're all about the the interaction. We want to see faces. Uh, I don't. We don't, we don't care about clicks, man. We just want to see your face. For sure, for sure. And if you want to read more about them, you can check out the uh, uh, past issue of Craft Beer and Brewing with uh, Beth Demon wrote a great breakout brewer. And of course, it was a recipe, um, you know, their base recipe for in praise of Bacchus Spontaneous Beer. If you'd like to support the podcast, go to beerandbrewing.com, click on the subscribe button. And if you're a pro brewer, consider our new All Access Pro subscriptions that combine both the magazines along with exclusive online content and more. Um, Jeff, thanks for joining me on the podcast. It's been great to talk about Oh, you. thank you for so much for having me. Yeah, it's been a blast. Yeah, cool. Cheers. All right. Peace. This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. For those that love to make and drink great beer, learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at craftbeerbrew.